Thank you very much for inviting me. It's fun to come down, um, especially your weather is as good as ours. Um, so uh, I want to actually call this uh, homological mirror symmetry for cusp singularities, because um, uh, that's a different term for the same thing that's important. So um, what's a cusp singularity? Well, that's just, um, it's an object from basically classical-ish algebraic geometry. Um, it's an isolated normal surface singularity. say, um, xp, uh, where p is, uh, x is the piece of surface, p is a singular, a singular point, uh, such that if I take a resolution, say, x tilde uh, maps to x by some projection pi, then the preimage of p is a cycle of transversely intersecting P1s. Um, and I'm going to call this D, the cycle. Th this is the name, my name for the divisor. Um, they don't count, actually. It's a degenerate case. Um, although uh, some of the things I'm going to say are going to, uh, are going to hold for uh, the single p one intersecting or two P1s intersecting. Um, this story starts with uh, a, a triangle. Um, so given uh, such a pair, say, x, D, um, there's a completely uh, algebraic procedure that gives a so-called dual cusp singularity uh, this is something that was first uh, studied extensively by Luhenga um, and in particular one of the things uh, he conjectured was that uh, if uh, the singularity, say, x, is smoothable, then uh, the dual singularity, uh, for the dual singularity, you can put the resolution on some closed projective variety rather than just having a local picture for the resolution. Um, and uh, one of, I think, the most striking applications so far of uh, mirror symmetry to you know, other parts of math uh, is uh, work of gross hacking and Kiel, uh, which uh, basically reinterprets and strengthens this duality uh, to a mirror symmetry statement. to prove uh, Luhenga's conjecture. Um, so this, this was something that you know, people worked a lot on in the 80s, and it was proved you know, 30 years later using this. Um, I should just say, this duality maybe is looking mysterious. On the level, so the divisor essentially determines the singularity. Um, the way the duality works is you just start with the intersection, the self, in the self intersection numbers for all the divisors, uh, and there's just an arithmetic formula that uh, gives you the self intersection numbers for the how many divisors and their self intersection numbers for the other guys. 
Um, so it's really, you know, um, something that you can go home and do. Um, there, the mirror symmetry statement here um, is very much sort of something that happens in the world of algebraic geometry. There's no symplectic geometry in sight. Um, and it turned out that uh, some spaces I was studying in my thesis uh, naturally arose here, and then it made sense to look at uh, mirror symmetry for these pairs from the sort of homological mirror symmetry perspective, where one of the sides is, uh, uh, is thought of as a symplectic manifold. Um, so now I get to justify, can I write all the way down? I can, right? Now I get to justify uh, to you from cusp to, from TPQR to cusp. So the affine cusp singularities um, are precisely uh, these so-called TPQR singularities. So an explicit equation is TPQR, PQ and R are positive integers. It's a three-parameter family. So it's just x to the p, y to the q, z to the r, plus a, x, y, z, ah. So a three-variable complex singularity. Uh, so p, q, and r are integers, and the sum of their reciprocals has to be less than 1. a is just any non-zero complex number. Um, and I won't talk about it much uh, explicitly, but the, uh, my work also extends to the case where there's an equality here instead of uh, this, uh, the inequality. So uh, today's theorems also hold for 1 over p, 1 over q, 1 over r equals 1. Um, in classical algebraic geometry speak, if that's what you're more familiar with, uh, these are known as the simple elliptic singularities. Um, there's actually just three of them. Um, if you do the numerology, and you want positive integers, the sum of the reciprocals, the sum of whose reciprocals are equals to one. Uh, there's only three of them. OK. Um, questions so far? All right. If you're greater than one, um, you, uh, well, you have to be careful with what you mean in terms of that, but essentially you're in the ADE range. The, oh, okay. the, the, the proper answer is your, your ADE. Um, anything else? OK, so I've told you what these cost singularities are. Um, they're going to be on the symplectic side, or more precisely, uh, on the symplectic side I'm going to have uh, the Milner fiber of TPQR. Yes. And well, these are surface singularities in the algebraic geometry sense, so they may not they may not be defined by a single equation. Okay. Um, this. Uh, if you're in your seminar where you're thinking of Arnold type singularity theory, you always have a single polynomial. But of course, to algebraic geometers in general, uh, singularities aren't affine or needn't be affine. Maybe I should have said that, oh shoot, locally, uh, so locally your piece of x would be cut out by this equation equals 0. I can't reach. 
Um, and you could also have a surface that's cut out by more equations that has a critical point, that has a singular point, so it's not a smooth real fourfold. Um, and if you try to, to describe what, what a neighborhood of that singular point in differential geometric singular point look like, you may not be able to do so with a single uh, polynomial equation. Does that make sense, or you're just nodding to move on? Um, so, so Lichinga's conjecture was saying one guy can be smoothed if the dual resolution can be put on uh, a closed projective surface. Uh, so on the symplectic side, well, in the affine case, it's easy to write down a smoothing um, because you just take uh, the Milner fiber of TPQR. Uh, I'm going to denote this as curly T sub P Q R. Um, and what this means is uh, I take my equation. When it's equal to 0, uh, it's a singular space. But if I just perturb a bit, make it equal to epsilon, now, at least in the neighborhood of the origin, what I have is a smooth variety. Uh, and I just intersect with some ball near the origin, because I'm only concerned with the topology near the singular point. Um, on the uh, complex side, I'm going to have uh, a space that comes from the dual cost singularity. So let me describe that to you. Um, I, well, one possibility is you start with P2. And now I pick three points, one of them on each of the toric boundary divisors, uh, sorry, toric divisors, components of the toric divisor. Uh, and I pick them collinear, so H is the line that they all lie on. And now I'm going to blow up uh, each of these points repeatedly, one of them p times, one of them q times, and one of them r times. So what's the outcome of this? Well, H is a line. So now, when I've blown up three times, I get, well, the strict transform is some H tilde, say, uh, which is a minus two curve. And initially, if I'd just blown up once each time, uh, let me, I'm going to put the divisor in green just for coherence with a picture in a minute. Um, well, initially, if you blow up once, you have three minus one curves. And the toric divisor would come in like this. But now, I'm blown up again. So what does that mean? Well, I take the new intersection points, and I blow those up. So apologies to note takers. I'm just erasing this. I get, so my minus one curve is now upgraded or downgraded to a minus two curve, and I get a new minus one curve. And I repeat iteratively. So in the end, I end up with some chain of minus two curves, and at the end, a minus one.
1 minus 3? Oh, plus 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Let me put back in the strict transform of the boundary. Um, so this is d, or d prime, depending on which side of this duality you're on. So I have a cycle of 3p1s. And let me look at the self-intersections. Well, one of them is 1 minus p, one of them is 1 minus q, and one of them is 1 minus r. Um, so suitably interpreted, uh, these pairs of spaces are going to be mirror. Um, one question uh, I sometimes get is, well, you know, you picked these really special points. But if you did you know, any collection of p points on one, any collection of q, any collection of r, blowing up, you would still get a cycle of divisors that looks exactly the same. Um, so let me put in as a remark uh, picking different uh, collections of PQ and R points. This corresponds uh, to uh, changing the symplectic form on this side. So essentially, you know, the, the essential changes of this, so the symplectic form that I'm equipping this Milner fiber with I um, guess I didn't specify, but uh, it's the standard exact one. So this is uh, a complex submanifold of C3. As such, it inherits uh, the standard exact Kähler form from C3. Um, but of course, you could pick any, you could deform that symplectic form by you know, any class in H2. Uh, and what that corresponds to is uh, picking different points on this side. Uh, I'm going to focus on the case where the form is exact. And we've, pick an, we've, picked, uh, we've picked the points to all be the same, and moreover, be collinear. So we'll maybe be clear in a sec when I give a geometric description of this space. Um, but you know that H2 of this space is spanned by vanishing cycles, so Lagrangian spheres. Um, so changing the symplectic form by an H2 class is just adding some multiples of the Lagrangian sphere classes. Um, and geometrically, it will be quite clear that Changing some of these points makes the minus two curves disappear. Minus two curves gives you spherical, give you spherical objects um, in the drive category of coherent sheaves. So intuitively, it's quite clear why, or if you're in, if, with your level of knowledge, it's quite clear why such a correspondence should be there. Um, so the key um, to basically the whole story uh, is uh, finding a good uh, geometric description of this space. Uh, so I'm going to describe this as a total space of a left shift vibration. Um, this is quite an experiment. So 
I'm going to de describe the Lefschetz vibration uh, immediately without giving much uh, background. If you don't know, I'll draw it and then say what I mean. But if you don't understand, you should cut me. So the fiber, smooth fiber, is a three punctured elliptic curve. Um, let me first draw some cycles on it. Colored lines, uh, the colored curves are going to be vanishing cycles. So what does this mean? Well, what I'm drawing for you is the fiber above this particular smooth point where five matching paths intersect. And the curves in the fiber are just you know, the restrictions at that point. Uh, the crosses mean a critical point in my left vibration. So if I start here and I deform along the green path, well, one of these three green meridians gets contracted. Uh, I didn't use three different colors because uh, I'm not sure it's that enlightening, and I'm also short on chalk. Um, so the, the purple one, this uh, purple curve which wraps around, if I deform along this path, that gets contracted to a point. Um, the purple and the orange one actually share a critical point. So you can check. Um, if you like Hervitz moves, that this picture is actually consistent. Um, and then there's these tails. So these are uh, like the tails that you see in sort of the AN, the standard left shift vibration on AN. So it's just there's a critical point for the green curve, for a green curve, and then another one here. And between them, there's a matching path in the base, which gives you a vanishing cycle upstairs. Um, and the length of these depends on p, q, and r. So this is p minus 1, or p minus 1 matching paths. p minus 2 matching paths, this one crosses. q minus 2, and r minus 2. Um, I know that up here I called the resolution pi. Um, I'd like to call this left shift vibration pi. I hope that's OK. Um, so let me call this, well, the total space is curly TPQR. I'll call the vibration pi. And let me call the fiber M. That's the three punctured elliptic curve. So are there questions about what this picture means? Lisa's good. She's smiling. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's happy? OK. I have a new appreciation for why Roger only wanted to talk about the A, D, E, C, D. So there, there, there should be like a, a lot of, I mean, the Mueller number is, is quite high. Yeah. Um, 
That's why there's these long tails. Uh, maybe it will be helpful for me to draw the Dinkin diagram associated with this, so encoding the intersection form. So the purple, so the, the fat dots are going to signify uh, vanishing cycles. Um, this is the intersection form on H2. So um, I should have maybe said, although it seems that everyone knows this, a basis for H2 is given by vanishing cycles. Um, i.e., uh, the curves that in this picture are given by uh, matching paths. So there's purple, orange, and then let me put in the green tails. So if you count up there, um, purple and orange intersect three times. So purple and the purple and orange two spheres only intersect at points where the matching paths meet in the base. In the middle point, when the fiber above they intersect three times, and they also intersect once at uh, what is the critical point right at the top. Um, it turns out that those have opposite orientations, so it cancels to give you uh, two intersection points in homology, um, which I'm drawing with these two dotted lines. Uh, and then they all intersect the first of the green chains once, and then it goes like this. Uh, so a full line means a self in an intersection of plus one. The double dashed line is minus two. Does that help? It's 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 diff it's pi is the pi is this map. Um, it is the vibration. Pi I'm defining to you pictorially. This is what pi is. I haven't given you an equation for, for pi. There isn't a good one. Um, the the hard work is even though this is a very natural vibration. Um, there isn't uh, a good expression for it. Well, they're the, no, they're the same. They're the same ones. This is the fiber above this point. So, what does this mean? Well, if you go along here, the green one contracts, and I'm telling you that it's the same cycle going out. So, they're taken in isolation. A green thing is just an AN chain. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everyone else? It's the same, it's the same cycle. Yeah, which is why it's like an AN chain. That's not helpful. Well, that depends on which left shift vibration you use. You can have a left shift vibration where, in the base, the AN chain looks like this, right? So that's exactly what I have here. And they intersect at all of the points. Does that help? Same 
Well, that's the case here in VA2, in the VAN there, or was this circle here? It's always the same. That's okay. So this, yeah. So this, uh, I mean, this is just a cylinder, but you could imagine just zooming in here. And that's precisely what you have going along here. Okay, I'm glad you got it. Um, is everyone else happy? All right, well, let's keep going. Um, how much of an obstruction is that visually? It's okay. Um, except I want to set up quite a big correspondence, so I'm actually going to go back to the central woods. Sorry, I should have thought that. So, um, loosely speaking, um, the data of the vibration on PQR is going to be mirrored to uh, the pair of, let me give uh, this a name. Uh, I'm going to call this the space Y. PQR. That's the total space uh, of this projective surface. Let me mirror term YPQR with D. So what are some Oh, there are three large erasers down there. That explains why there's only small ones here. Um, here are some precise statements. So First of all, I can take um, the directed Foucault category associated to pi. Um, I'll define that more. Um, for now, let me just write uh, directed uh, Foucault category. Uh, this is going to be mirror to uh, coherent sheaves on the whole of YPQR, where again uh, I take the derived category. Um, maybe I'll call this equivalence one. Um, I could also just look at the Foucault category of the fiber M, uh, again derived. Um, this is just, you know everyone's favorite version of the Foucault category. So uh, defined with exact compact Lagrangians. Uh, this is isomorphic uh, to the category of perfect complexes on D. So um, if you don't do mirror symmetry every day. Maybe it's worth remembering um, on a smooth variety like YPQR, um, the category of coherent sheaves is the same as perfect complexes because any coherent sheaf can be written as a complex of vector bundles. Uh, on singular spaces like D, that's no longer true. Uh, and so instead, we consider so called perfect complexes, which is just you know, the algebraically equivalent thing. You take uh, complexes of vector bundles. Um, 
And then uh, you can combine these in a way I'll talk more about uh, to study the raptor care category of TPQR. Uh, now, uh, this is something that doesn't depend on pi at all. This is uh, the raptor care category. of TPQR. Uh, so this allows um, exact Lagrangians that are either compact or have, you know, non-compact but have some controlled behavior as you go to infinity. So uh, your favorite example is probably just uh, taking some Legendrian and the cone over that in the simplectization that you have near the boundary. Um, and now this is going to be mirror to uh, the drive category coherent sheaves on the complement. So YPQR, and I remove D. So before I delve into, uh, so there's some, uh, there's a few different flavors of the Foucault category uh, that you could look at instead of the rep category of TPQR. And there are some analogous statements with, say, coherent sheaves with certain kinds of support on this side. Um, I'll just focus on these three. You can ask me if you're interested. Um, the general proof strategy is to prove one and two sort of by hand and understand those very well. Um, it turns out there's also some relation sort of between one and two. Uh, and you can, once you have these two isomorphisms, uh, there's a general machine that allows you to get this isomorphism sort of algebra well, for free modulo hard algebra or hard geometry that other people have done. Um, so at this point, it's worth saying, well, pi is really, really important because you know, this third statement, this is going to be true no matter what. Um, you know, this rep Foucault category doesn't know about pi. Um, but if I look at this projective variety, well, it has this preferred compactification, which is where I just put, back, put d back in. Um, if I picked you know, any old left chest vibration on TPQR instead of this really good one, well, um, in general, I wouldn't have any hope of proving this because it would, you know, morally speaking, you'd expect it to correspond to some sort of compactification of this space, but you really have no reason to get this really good one. Uh, and then you wouldn't be able to get off the ground. I mean, it might not be something smooth. It might not, it might be non-commutative. I mean, we really don't know. Um, so that's, uh, that's the general remark. Um, now let me start telling you about 1 and 2 and this algebraic relation. So that's essentially going to be the, the rest of the talk. Um, other, questions ab other questions at this stage? None. Is your work? I mean, I guess all of the isomorphisms are my work. Uh -huh. um, some of the tools that I use are other people's work. Um, and maybe that will be more apparent as I go into details. Okay. Um, so let me talk to you about one. Well, yes. It's the directed for care category. There's an arrow here. No, it's an, uh, it's an invariant of the left chest vibration. Uh, I was about to talk precisely about that, so let me do some writing as well as some talking. 
Um, so given uh, so for the directed full chi category of the left chest vibration, well, you pick some smooth point. Then you have, I really want to keep using the nice color chalk because I know it erases. You have a bunch of critical points. Uh, you pick paths joining them to the origin, say gamma 1, I think I went to the other way, gamma 1 through gamma n. And then each of the gamma i's gives a vanishing cycle vi in m. Remember, m is the fiber. Uh, so I mean, I'll draw one. But in general, there will be as many as there were points, critical points in the basis of this vibration. Uh, of course, uh, you can probably guess some of them are going to be repeated. There's only so many curves here. Um, and now, the directed uh, Foucault category is given by specifying that the homs from vi to vj, well, if, ah, I'm worried about this space here. John, yeah. great. So if i is less than j, the order's preserved, re uh, respected, then uh, we just get to take the Fleur complex between vi and vj. If they're equal, we sort of artificially put in, or at least from this perspective, artificially put in uh, an identity element. Uh, I'm assuming I'm working over c. And in the final case, we just put 0. And now, this is an infinity category just by uh, using you know, all of the uh, standard A infinity operations that respect uh, the indices. infinity flare products. Uh, and I should have said these VI are just the generators. Oh, actually, before doing derived there, they're the only objects. So um, this category has you know, finitely many objects. And because of the ordering, there's only finitely many possible non-trivial infinity products between them. Moreover, M is a Riemann surface. So I can just draw my collection of S1s on the Riemann surface uh, and count what the Fleur, what, what the holomorphic polygons are between them. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a combinatorial problem, and actually, uh, because there's so much symmetry with these long tails, it reduces to something that's like reasonably tractable. Uh, so this gets calculated. I won't give you the explicit description, but it's uh, uh, calculate sort of completely by hand. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, once you pass to the derived category, it no longer depends on the choice of paths. Um, because, for instance, you're introducing uh, cones. And what a cone corresponds to is a Dane twist, which would be a Hurwitz move, so switching a path to another path. Um, so you're absolutely right. The directed Foucault category depends on a lot of choices. Uh, once you pass to the derived one, it doesn't. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, it turns out that for a good choice of path, there are sort of generators for this that exactly match up. Um, that's my, my next. 
So, well, um, coherence sheaves on P2, DB co P2, um, that has a semi orthogonal decomposition. Uh, like this. Uh, this is a result of Balenson. Um, and uh, because Y PQR is obtained by repeatedly blowing this up, we can use work of Bondol and Orloff, uh, which gives us a semi orthogonal decomposition. DB co the YPQR. Um, I think it's not informative to give details if uh, this isn't a formula that you're familiar with. Let me just say that uh, well, semi orthogonal decomposition means you have morphisms, uh, you have some sequence of generators and you have morphisms one way but not the other way. That's precisely what we have with a directed Foucault category. Um, and for the outcome of this algorithm is we have three generators uh, from P2. So pulling back these three. And then for each blow up, you add a generator. Uh, so blowing up P points, I'm going to have P for one uh, component of the toric divisor, Q for another, and R for another. Now, uh, how do things, I can tell you on some level how things match up. Well, these three are going, or you can pick paths so that they correspond to those th the three you had here, these three generators. And then the P1s correspond to the sequence of P critical points. The Q correspond to the Q critical points of pi. And the R to the R critical points of pi. I'll put P critical points. the ones that I had in green. Um, so even though I'm not telling you what the infinity category actually is, this is, this is how the matching happens. OK. Um, let me swap here. Yeah, so, so what I did is um, I reverse, I mean, you're sort of, you're already expecting this to be the mirror because this was already a very nice left vibration. And then I reverse engineered. I was like, well, Bondolulov gives you this. The numbers and the patterns are kind of matching. Let's see if we can get vanishing paths to actually get this. Um, in particular, starting with these. Um, if you actually restricted just if you restrict if you forgot about all of the green points in the left vibration, uh, what you end up with is the standard left vibration on C star square, the one mirror to P2. Uh, so you can start by picking something for those and then slot in all of the green ones. There's some specific picture of that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, of course the derived things would always be equivalent, but it's nicer to match up the generators. All right. Um, the second uh, equivalence in a way is even more lowbrow because so the Foucault category of M turns out is generated by this S1 and these three. So these split, well, they split generate. Uh, 
uh, and there's uh, lots of different arguments that lots of different tools in the literature that will enable you to argue this quite fast. Uh, I want this to correspond to uh, complexes of vector bundles on a cycle of three P1s. Um, and it turns out that the correspondence is, well, this is one just corresponds to the structure sheaf. Uh, I'll put OD. And then you can pick some interior point, say, uh, and then these three correspond to the push forward of the structure sheaf of A, so the, the skyscraper sheaf, uh, and similar with B and C. Um, and now, let me go. There's a lot I want to preserve. I think it's OK to erase this. I mean, one is two is elementary enough that you know, if you were a student arguing for credit or something, you could make a case. Um, but that's uh, morally no. Um, right. So there are maps. Let me put back. So there is a map from coherent sheaves on Y to here just by pullback. Um, there's a map from here to here, uh, um, which you can think of in some loose sense as sort of forget in the on objects, well, the objects of pi of this category um, were just S, S1s in M. And now inside here, there's just more morphisms between them. Um, so in fact, if I call say, this A and this B, a prime and B prime, uh, then, well, I'm sweeping some things under the rug at this point, but uh, uh, B is an A infinity A A by module. Maybe we'll call it A by module. Uh, and similarly for B prime with A prime. And if you analyze, uh, the isomorphisms I was sketching carefully enough, uh, you'll see that these bimodule structures agree. Now, Well, they, they, there's also isomorphisms between the categories. Um, you can do it. That's why I'm sweeping things under the rug. You can find, uh, you know, formally, uh, the derived category would be the category over modules over A, where A would just be the thing with the generators, and then this is the category over modules over A prime and A and A prime are isomorphic. So certainly the categories of modules over them are isomorphic. Um, now you wish you hadn't asked. Um, so, um, given a b, a prime, and b prime, um, completely algebraically, you can uh, extract two things. Uh, so, 
there's the short exact sequence uh, uh, and similarly here um, this is a short exact sequence of a by modules uh, this turns out to be the dual uh, shifted uh, on the symplectic side that's the theorem of Paul. On the algebraic side, um, it just follows, uh, when you unwind the definition, it's precisely the fact that D is anti-canonical. Um, so you extract some structures. Uh, the first one, so from the pair, and more precisely the, the short exact sequence, the first one is uh, a functor. Uh, from, say, db folk to itself, or on this side, db co to itself. Um, on this side, the functor is tensoring with Um, the structure sheaf for minus d. Um, on this side, the functor is given by the monodromy of the Lefschetz vibration. Um, given time, I'm just going to state things, and for the people who are algebraic and kind or say, familiar with Shill's work, we we can talk more. Um, you also get a natural transformation uh, from, well, in this case, mu, say t from mu to the identity. In this case, t from this tensoring to the identity. Um, so I'm giving you the geometric interpretations. On the algebraic, these structures agree just because I started out with equivalent data. Um, and the punchline, um, given an infinity category or a, a pair of bimodules with natural transformation like this, uh, there's a completely algebraic localization procedure that you can do. And the outcome, well, let's imagine continuing symplectic algebraic. On this side, by work, of Abu Zaid and Seidel, uh, the outcome of the localization procedure is the rep Foucault category. Uh, whereas on this side, uh, and that's easier to show, uh, the outcome is coherent sheaves on the complement. Um, to say, one final word. Um, you can imagine passing from the rep Foucault from the directed Foucault category to the wrapped one by sort of increasingly wrapping also in the base, uh, as opposed to just uh, wrapping a tiny bit, which is one of the definitions of this category if you're an expert. Um, and what the localization with respect to the national transformation is doing is essentially that. It's sort of putting in higher and higher powers of mu and taking that into account in a suitable way. On this side, well, here I can actually tell you what the natural transformation is. It's multiplying by a defined section for d. And so you can imagine if you have some morphism groups and then you're multiplying with uh, higher and higher powers of the defining section as you take morphisms, that uh, the contributions of 
whatever part of the sheaf is on D just disappears. So you're left with uh, coherent sheaves on the complement. Um, so loosely geometrically, that's what's going on. Um, we started a few minutes late, but I've now met an hour. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>